Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Arielle Cates. I'm the Director of Programming at Village Preservation. So glad that you're all here. Um, a quick bit about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host roughly 75 programs a year, all of which are now virtual and most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, history and depth and the value of preservation in our communities, not to mention the arts and small business. We are a nonprofit membership based organization, so your involvement and support mean the world to us. You can learn more at our new website, villagepreservation.org, and please consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able at villagepreservation.org slash donate. So just a little bit of Zoom protocol. I'm going to go dark for a little while, um, but I will be here. So please feel free to use the chat to say hi, um, tell us where you're joining from, or if there are um, any issues with the, with the Zoom generally. If you have questions specifically for Rick and Matt, please use the Q&A function, which you can do at any point during the talk. And we will get to those, um, to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, following the talk. So I am very pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. A New York City native, Matt Umanoff, uh, knew what he wanted to do from the start. At 18, he was already fixing guitars for the likes of Eric Clapton. In 1969, he and his wife founded Matt Umanoff Guitars, a guitar and repair shop that held sway in Greenwich Village until 2017. Today, the brick and mortar retail store is closed, but Matt continues to provide guitar restoration and repair by appointment. In his oral history and Greenwich Village stories features um, through Village Preservation, Matt regales listeners and readers with tales of the vibrant village music scene of the past few decades, when famous folks like Bob Dylan and Johnny Cash frequented his shop. Um, Rick Kelly is the founder and owner of Carmine Street Guitars. Since the 1990s, he has been crafting guitars from reclaimed New York City wood, making use of 200-year-old white pine that would otherwise be discarded from the ceaseless renovations throughout the city, as well as from any recyclable wood that a customer brings him. He has worked with big names like Jim Jarmusch, John Belushi, and David Bowie. In 2018, director Ron Mann made a documentary highlighting this cornerstone village music institution. So Rick, you're gonna start and Matt, you're gonna follow um, and then we'll open up for questions. So just to, um, to frame this for, for you, we would love to hear the story of your shop and your work in the musical village and how you see your work in relation to the small business landscape in the village generally. We'd love to hear what your favorite and wildest experiences have been. And also, of course, how your experiences of the last nine months have been, how your businesses and communities have changed and how you think that might play out in the future. So thank you both so much. <coughs> Rick, take us away. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, let me just start with uh, the building we're in right here is, uh, 1827 right here in Greenwich Village on uh, Carmine Street and um, this this uh, building is one of the oldest on the block there's three houses in a row with a little peak roof and little dormers and uh, I started in this store in 1990 or 30 years ago today and uh, before that I was around the corner on Downing Street I had a shop in 1976 I moved into Downing Street 37 Downing, that was the first shop. And uh, I guess that's that's where it all started for me. I had many shops before that. I started building actually in 1970s, 1968 was the first guitar I made. And then uh, I, I was in college at the time and I started you know, building down there. But when I moved to Downing Street, I kind of uh, really did what I wanted to do, which was 
come back to Greenwich Village. I'm also a native New Yorker. I was born in Jamaica, Queens and grew up here. And, uh, you know, it was always my goal to come back to the village. And in 1976, I found that little store on Downing Street right next to a, an Italian social club. Of course, we had many stories with the club next door. That was uh, pretty exciting and very interesting. And a lot of times, you know, the guys would come in with their Cadillacs at Friday night and start playing cards, come out. You'd see them come out with a three-day growth on Monday morning. <laughs> They'd been there playing cards all night. But uh, they kind of put up with me. But that's where I first started working for Lou Reed. And I started uh, building guitars for him. And uh, I got to meet David Bowie. And he bought a guitar for me then. And one day, uh, John Bellucci walked into the store. And he uh, got a guitar. and I actually got to deliver it to his house. He was living over on Morton Street at the time. And uh, I got to meet his wife, Judy. We sat down and of course had to have a Pepsi. It was right during the Saturday Night Live when he was uh, kind of at his peak. And uh, I remember he had all these photographs of the characters he played on Saturday Night, which was the Coneheads and the Saturday Night Samurai. But they never were on the wall. They were just leaning against the wall on the floor. And I always thought that was curious, but he kind of became somewhat of a friend. Showed me a picture of him and Keith Richards in his kitchen and said, I'm going to bring him by the shop. And of course, it, uh, that was another really exciting moment for me to meet Keith Richards. He actually came to this shop and did uh, uh, an interview on CBS where uh, he was promoting his new book at the time. Are we going to get questions or I just have to keep going? <laughs> we get questions, but definitely okay. keep going. <laughs> All right. Well, I think the next thing you wanted to know was um, like uh, experiences or how it, how it affects the village and in, in my time here. Or... Yeah, sure. That's right. Uh, let's see. The village. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, this is the place where you want to be if you're a guitar maker, especially on this block. It seems we, this guitar shop had uh, a lot of other builders on Carmine Street over the years, right? Anywhere from, I think it started like with Jose Rubio. I don't know Matt would probably know better, but uh, he yeah. was around the corner back in the 60s. Right at the, at the corner of uh, Bedford and Carmine. Yeah. A few little places there, there are half a dozen guys. Yeah, Michael Gurian, uh, Tom Hong, Michael, Tom, Humphrey, Tom Humphrey. Yeah, Rubio, Lucian Tom Barnes. Tom. Everybody was here. It's just so weird that they all happened to be here on Carmine Street. And uh, yeah, I'm continuing right here on Carmine Street building guitars. And we've had, um, you know, of course, being here, you get to meet all kinds of celebrities. And we've had uh, all kinds of people come in here. I guess some of my most proudest moments were having Bob Dylan play my guitars and he sent me pictures of him playing the guitar in Beijing and Australia and then having Lou play my guitar at Carnegie Hall that was pretty special and uh, having Patti Smith play my guitar at Bowery Ballroom and see her rip the strings off at the end of her set on her birthday those are moments I'll never forget and I'll always cherish and uh I think the, the other thing that we do different here in this shop is we use uh, reclaimed New York City wood to build guitars from. And uh, I think it's very special because this wood came from 300-year-old giant white pine trees that kind of, kind of grew all the way up into the Adirondacks from here all the way up before there was a city. They pretty much built the whole city out of these timber. It was called the Kingswood because the King of England wanted to use this wood for his military ship mast. But uh, they built the city out of it anyway. And now the wood has been indoors for almost 200 years and it's just super seasoned and it's old growth. You know, the trees were huge. So the wood is, is really special, very resonant. It really makes it a wonderful uh, solid body electric guitar. And uh, that's kind of what what we do a little different here. And um, yeah, I don't know, remember what the last question was. How's it, how's it been these last nine? Oh yeah, yeah, how has it been through the COVID? Well, 
you know, of course, we've been shut down like everybody else, and it looks like we may be going into another shutdown now. But I, um, even during the early part of it, I was kind of sneaking down here every day on my bicycle, all masked up and covered up, and I'd stay in the shop and work for my eight hours or so and go home. And uh, But, you know, I've got about a two-year waiting list for guitars now, so I've always had plenty of work to do and a lot to do here. Even with the shop closed, it seems like I've been making a lot more guitars. I think during the first quarantine, I made 21 guitars just in those first three months. It was, it was just nothing but work, work, work. You know, I got so much done. So in some ways, it's been, um, I don't want to say a blessing. It's horrible. But it's, uh, it was good for me because I had that work and I was able to continue on. But uh, I feel so bad for other businesses that are really struggling right now. And uh, I, I wish them all the best. And uh, hopefully with the vaccine, we'll be, we'll be through with this soon and we'll be able to get back to normal. And, uh, but, uh, you know, Godspeed to everybody. Keep, uh, keep wearing your masks and doing the right thing. This is no joke. And we've got to keep the uh, healthcare workers safe uh, until they get their vaccines, which I think is happening today, hopefully. But uh, yeah, the business has been, um, you know, we, we, we have, uh, the rents here aren't cheap, let's put it that way, you know, the, the city's expensive, the village is very expensive, and if you don't own your building, you're paying rent, and it's, it's it eats a big chunk, so you, you have to work, and hopefully things uh, continue on. Do you own your building? No, <laughs> no, I don't own, I rent, but I have a wonderful landlady that's very understanding. They've been here five generations, and um, you know we're we're able to to get along. She hasn't uh, you know said anything one way or the other, but you know it's just uh, it's been it's been okay, and um, yeah, thank God that uh, we have you know good people in the neighborhood. Yeah, so everything's okay. We're we're moving along, and everything's uh, been been well, been good. <clears throat> Thanks, <laughs> Matt. How, how's it? How about you? Tell tell us a story. Okay, re refresh me again. The first question is. Ah yes, tell us the story of your shop and your work in the musical village. Oh well, um, before I had a store, I was doing repairs and restorations. Um, I don't even know where to start here. Uh, I had been uh, building banjo necks and. I, I was I was one of those kids who took apart everything and put it back together. And I had gotten my first Martin guitar, which was an old one when I was in high school. Fearless, took it apart, uh, put it back together, wanted to see what was in it. And um, finished high school at the age of 16. I went to Brooklyn Tech, had a wonderful 1930s style education with a foundry, a machine shop, mechanical drawing and everything like that. And um, uh, went to Northeastern University for three months, turned 17 and dropped out. I was much more interested in building guitars and in hanging out at the guitar shops in Boston and came back and um, immediately got a job at Gretsch, uh, the Gretsch factory in Brooklyn, which became a co-op. I'm sure many of you have seen it on the right when you go across Williamsburg Bridge. And um, they had me doing silly things at first, but they saw I was real good. Uh, and new guitar making, which most of the factory workers did not. They just, you know, knew their individual jobs. Uh, guitar factories do not want guitar makers. They want people who will show up and do their job well. But uh, they immediately moved me into final assembly. I was one of a crew of six at the age of 18. Between uh, the, the spray room and the shipping department, we'd get guitars, electric guitars, hollow body from uh, straight out of the finishing department. You had to drill all the holes, install all the electronics, all the hardware, the tuning machines, set them up, make them play right, and send them off for final shipping to stores. And uh, at a certain point after that, they put me in, uh, in the repair department, me and three old guys. And uh, uh, it was, uh, there wasn't a lot I learned there other than uh, about how things might move through a factory. I was familiar with the machinery, I was familiar with guitar making, but it was definitely a great experience, and uh, to this day, I am still in touch with Freddie Gretsch, whose uncle was running it at the time. Freddie is about my age. I think we're about the only two people left uh, from that factory who are still around and remember it. At any rate, from there, 
I had uh, little repair shops around um, here in Lower Manhattan. I had a few different locations, and uh, I became the go-to guy for repairs. If you had a truly precious instrument and you wanted uh, best work done on it, I was the only one to trust. I was 18, 19, 20 years old, and um, I got to, to meet back in those years, uh, Eric Clapton, uh, it goes on and on and on, uh, Bob Dylan, everybody. I did some work for Danny Armstrong, who some of you guitar nuts may recall, uh, the clear plexiglass solid body guitars of the late 60s. I hand built the prototypes for Danny. He gave me a piece of paper with some rough drawings and I fleshed it out, uh, designed all the details, uh, hand built the first guitar and bass, and uh, that was a whole other project. I've still got those papers. At any rate, um, eventually, um, I did, uh, uh, I had gotten married in mid-1969 and my wife was saying, hey, let's do something together. And we found an empty storefront on Bedford Street between Carmine and Downing, right around the corner from where Rick is now. Um, my good friend, best friend to this day, Michael Gurian, uh, had a guitar making shop. He was building classical guitars around the corner at Carmine Street, living in a, a sleeping loft in the back of the storefront there. And that particular space had prior been occupied by uh, Dave Rubio took the name, well, Jose Rubio, his name was David Rubinson, but uh, he was looking for something a little more flashy. And Lucian Barnes and other guitar makers. And um, uh, Michael actually helped me to find that place down the, right down the block from him on, uh, he had a separate place with machines in it in, um, on Bedford Street there. And uh, Susie and I opened up that store and uh, I was in that location for eight years. Uh, in 1977, I moved to what, um, those of you who are familiar with John's Pizza here on Bleecker Street across from me now, they have two rooms, a large one and a small one. The small one was my store from 1977 to 82. And in 82, I was fortunate enough to get this place, which here at uh, 273 Bleecker across the street, triple the size. It was one of those neighborhood swaps. Uh, the guy who owned this building was a neighborhood guy. You know, you talk to this guy, you talk to that guy. The Johns people got my old place. I got this place. It was triple the size with an equal basement. So I went from about 600 feet to 2,000 feet with a 2,000 foot basement. And let me tell you, it didn't take long for us to fill it up. So uh, uh, eventually I was able to get the, uh, the second floor as well. This was as a rental. Um, at first we had the repair shop in the back. We got our dealerships, Martin, Gibson, Fender, everybody like that, other people, Taylor, uh, other brands, PRS. And we started carrying all the, all the little accessories and all. Uh, uh, an interesting side fight is that when we were on Bedford Street in our little place, it was purely by word of mouth. If you didn't know about us, you didn't find us. I mean, that's what, it was not a well-traveled retail street. As we were moving into 276 Bleecker, which now next door to John's, Literally, while we were moving in, this was, a, I mean, it was a major shopping street still. They were, uh, Bleecker Street was the, had been the shopping street for the local Italian-American community since the late 19th century. And meanwhile, people, tourists were walking in, do you have this, do you have that, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, I saw a great opportunity for accessories, strings and books and all kinds of stuff. And I was having so much fun with uh, building up all that stuff. This is in 1978 or so, or 77. I was having so much fun that I stopped smoking pot because we used to do a lot of that back in the 60s. But I, I never went back to it. I mean, it was just like I had, <laughs> so, I had so much stuff to do when I was having, it was like playing with your baseball cards. It was like arranging all kinds of stuff and uh, moving across to, across to here though with triple the size and an equal basement. That was a whole new ball game. And, um, and that's what led me uh, to the Fender people, et cetera. I had already been selling Martins and Guilds and other stuff for years. Uh, around 1993 or so, um, I was able to buy the building from the owner who lived around the corner. He was a local guy. He had a lot of buildings. Rick, you know some of the buildings. He owned 30 Carmine was one of his buildings, which was um, the home, the first home of a urban spice store called Aphrodisia, which was run by my friend Jimmy, Jimmy Adelson. Uh, so Dominic, who lived around the corner here on Leroy Street. He liked me a lot. And after about eight or 10 years, he said, you want to buy the building? I'll, you know, we'll make a deal and I'll cover you. You want to, Dominic said, you won't have to go to no bank. I'll make you a deal. 
and it was wonderful. And uh, I worked my butt off for the next 25 years to pay it off. And in the meanwhile, um, I took over the second floor for workshop and uh, office space, which we still I still have. And we were able to expand uh, the main floor, the area that had been uh, office and workshop that became more retail. And we just kept expanding and expanding, uh, adding showcases. Rick, when I closed up, didn't you end up with a couple of my showcases? Yeah, I have them in the store now. You have them to this day, yeah. The, yeah. With, with the rounded ends, are those yours? Oh yeah, beautiful cases. We're in, uh, in an old uh, shop, you said they were in an old- uh, oh, There's a story. There's a, did, did, do you ever have occasion to go to NAMM shows? Oh yeah, I've been there. You've been, you've been to the NAMM show in Anaheim in January. Yes. For those of you who don't know, it's trade only, uh, not open to the public. Right. It is um, a half a mile indoors from end to end. It is about 1500 exhibitors of uh, guitar manufacturers, piano manufacturers, music publishers, companies that make latches for cases. It goes on and on and on. And um, those two showcases were, it was a company that was making cables, like, you know, guitar cables, and they had them there. And um, they had brought them in from Minnesota or someplace for their display. And they, I stopped by and I'm looking at the cases and they said, would you like to take our line of cables? No, I got enough cables. Oh, you really need our cables? No, but would you like to sell me these showcases? Um, and, and they did, and they trucked them in from California to New York. That's great. So they, they, that, that's where I got those. At any rate, um, we ran that store, that clubhouse as it were, because it really was, you never knew who would walk in there. Um, uh, up until 2017, I had 48 years of retail. I closed it because it was enough. I wasn't forced out. It wasn't a rent situation. Uh, I didn't have that problem, thankfully. And uh, we had a hell of a good time. Uh, I'll tell you, there, there was a point um, about 10 years ago or so when um, a couple of the guys said, gee, let's make a list of all the famous people who came in here. This is 10 years ago. We ended up with three or 400 names. I haven't added to it since. I dug it out today. It's, it, it goes on and on. It's incredible. Uh, the stories are endless. Um, but uh, did you want one story, Ariel? I'll take a story. I'll, I'll tell you. Well, there, there's hundreds and hundreds of I mean, <laughs> from Bill Cosby calling up to uh, the people who walk in here, General William C. Westmoreland. Uh, those of you old enough to remember the Vietnam War, Gracious. he was of all the armed forces in Vietnam. Uh, Yul Brynner, the you, younger generation don't know who he is, but Katie Couric, it, it was unbelievable. Richard Gere, uh, musicians, it, I, I, I can't even begin to think. I'm, I'm looking here at a shotgun list. Julian Welch, um, The Strokes, Wilco, Radiohead. These are, of course, older names to a lot of people now, but... Uh, Chris Whitley, the Roche Girls, Lou Reed. Lou came in, we actually played together a couple of times and I am not a good guitar player. Um, oh, it goes on and on. But um, so Johnny Cash and his wife, June Carter, they're wonderful people. Uh, and his daughter, Roseanne is a good friend. She was the customer too, but so Johnny and June came in one day and um, uh, they, Johnny wanted to buy a guitar uh, as a gift. I think it was a gift for Marty Stewart. And it was three or four thousand dollars, which was a lot in those days for uh, an old Telecaster. Today it's a thirty thousand dollar guitar. Then it was a three thousand dollar guitar, whatever. So um, it was usual for people of that, you know, status as performers. They're going to buy something. They'll pull out an American Express card. Well, John takes out a Mastercard or a Visa. I forget which it was. He said, "Okay, so." In those days, we did not have the kind of quick approval that you stick a card in and you get bang, you get something on the screen. It didn't work that way. Stick the card in, and if there was any question, you get a notice that said call. So it said call. So I call up, and I get some impersonal operator in God knows where, and she says, uh, is the card holder present? Lady, it's Johnny Cash. Is the card holder present, please? Lady, it's Johnny Cash. She says, does the card holder have any ID? Lady, <laughs> Johnny Cash. Oh, it's a little more explicit than that. She said, may I speak with the card holder, please? So I said, John, I, I hand him the phone. He picks up the phone and he goes, 
Hello, I'm Johnny Cash. We hit the deck. We all hit the deck. June Carter hit the deck. We, we couldn't stop laughing. Uh, so that's, um, that's one of the stories. There, there, were, uh, there were people who walked in off the street here, drunks and crazy people who I wish I had had a camera rolling. Um, there's more. Uh, it, it's endless. There's one story that is in a book. There was a book put out. I think it was maybe GVSHP put it out. The Greenwich Village Stories. Ariel, was that? That's book? us. Greenwich Village Stories, a little hardcover. Yeah, I'll, I'll put the link into the chat, everybody. Yeah, um, well, they, they asked different people to write stories about coming up in the village, and they asked me to write one, and I wrote one little one. This was on Bedford Street, so it was maybe 1975 or so. Um, we had, didn't have a lot of guitars hanging up, maybe a dozen guitars, and some kid came in, and he picked up a guitar and started playing, and he was terrible. It was out of tune. He was just god awful. And um, we're about to like, we're, we're about to give him the boo. We just couldn't listen anymore. Bob Dylan walks in. Nobody says a word. Bob doesn't say a word. He picks up another guitar off the wall and starts playing with these, this kid. And together they were just awful. I mean, it was just terrible. After about 20 minutes of this, the kid gets up and he leaves. After that, Bob leaves. A week later, the kid walks back into the store and he says uh, to my wife, Susie, he says, um, you know who I was just playing guitar with in Washington Square Park? She says, who is that? I was just playing guitar with David Peel. Now, those of you who remember, David Peel was that half a marijuana guy and always, you know, yelling all over the neighborhood. Susie says, David Peel, you know who you were playing guitar with in here last week? He says, no. She says, it was Bob Dylan. The kid goes, Bob Dylan. And I thought those were my vibes. So <laughs> it, it goes on and on and on. There's, uh, I, you, know, it, you know, with 50 plus years of, of this kind of thing, there's, uh, there's going to be a lot of different happenings. And uh, that's the one thing I miss actually about uh, not having, not running that hockey talk anymore. It was, um, it took a lot of work to keep that, to keep that place going uh, a lot more than was Obvious when you walked in the door, you saw 500 guitars hanging up and all the accessories. It took a lot of work. I had a wonderful staff, wonderful manager, Danny Reisbeck. Reisbeck, he kept so many balls in the air uh, with the staff, with, with uh, inventory, but it wore on me after a while. And um, I just, you know, I, it, it, was, it was time to close it. Uh, but that's the one thing I missed. Um, you know, not, not, you know, that you'd be down there in the, the, the short time I was on the floor ever because I was mostly up in my office running the place, but you never knew who would walk in and uh, old friends would walk in sometimes. I mean, high school girlfriend or third grade or somebody or just somebody odd. Uh, oh, Professor Irwin Corey walked in. Uh, you kids probably don't know him, but he was sort of a, a comedian and uh, we had a hell of a good time. I'll say that. Um, What's your next question? Um, how's it been for the last nine months? Well, it hasn't been all that different than it's been for the last three years, to tell you the truth, because um, what I've been doing is we've kept the repair business, repair and restoration going. And we do always have done our repairs or restorations. It could have been a 10-year-old guitar or a 150-year-old Martin that somebody sat on. We, we would do that or just plain repairs and, and, and uh, you know, simple uh, adjustments and stuff. Um, the one person who is still here from my staff is uh, Yuri Kovalev, Yuri Kovalev, who is uh, in all the 50 years we ran this place, he's the best repair person I ever had. Um, I can say that um, uh, there is, there's no one better anywhere in America. And um, he comes in when he wants to. I run the intake and outgo end of the repair business. It's by appointment. So it's, I get basically the same number of people coming in the last nine months as I have for the last three years, two or three a week. Of course, now it's with masks and all. And I tell them they've got to wipe down their guitar in the case with alcohol uh, before they come in. Um, and we, we limit the visits from one person. So uh, there's that. Plus, um, I've always had a website, well, not always, but for maybe the last 20 years. And um, we built it up some more. And um, 
people would, well, the last few years, bring me guitars they want to sell. And um, they go up on my website. And uh, uh, when I have maybe about 10 or so pieces um, to, you know, nice pieces to sell, I'll send out an emailing to my the mailing list I built up. Um, I always say 10 or 12,000 of my closest friends, which is what it is. And um, this stuff is usually gone in a matter of hours because uh, it's always nice stuff. We have our reputation. Um, I make sure that the prices are very attractive because today's market is not what it used to be. Uh, the, the market for vintage guitars has receded along with the hairlines of all those baby boomer guys who over the last 40 years bought all that stuff they didn't really need. And so many of them are selling right now. And a lot of the, um, a lot of the buyers, name with them, aren't buying, and the younger generation is not as interested in the, the vintage stuff. So I make sure my prices are good, and I do the write-ups myself, which I love doing. It's, it's always been my favorite thing in the day to sit down and write these descriptions. Um, they're not the usual dry guitar website descriptions with numbers and stuff. I'll, I, uh, I, I obsess over every adjective and uh, punctuation mark, and um, I try to throw some humor in there too. So the last nine months, pretty much the same as for the last three years. I get stuff to sell, I sell it, I ship it. My FedEx guy comes, I guess repairs in, repairs out. And now with this load of 100 plus guitars coming in, I got enough to keep me busy for a year. So uh, that, that's what's been going on here the last nine months. Uh, the, the biggest difference is that everybody has to wear a mask and I rarely go out of the building too, because I do live here as well. So uh, I'm fortunate in that regard. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> so okay. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come back in because we have about a thousand questions. So I'm just gonna start. I'm just gonna start asking them to you. Um, and folks, just as a reminder, I cannot keep track of what's in the chat. So if you have a question that you really want me to ask, please put it in the Q&A. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm going to start with some questions that I got over the course of today via email. Um, Chris wants to know, did Guitar Center opening in Union Square and Rudy's moving to Soho have an impact on your businesses? So I guess, and I guess I would love to open that question up to be, you know, more about sort of the business landscape in the neighborhood in general and, and how, what your observations of that have been. Um, who would you like to answer this? Both of you? Rick, I, I, I would think it might not have affected you very much. Well, Guitar Center, you know, I don't think that we really needed Guitar Center in New York City. It's just like having a Walmart or- I agree. You know, I think the mom and pop shops of the village, the way it used to be, and you used to be able to go to a vegetable store on the corner, and I really miss that, you know. Um, but, and they did have an effect on us. I think Rudy's come down here was great. I loved it. That's why I moved to this store, because Matt was around the corner. So I figured we could feed off each other. I would send him stuff I couldn't do. He'd send me stuff he didn't want to do, for the most part. And that's kind of the way it went for I guess the uh, 30 years I was over here, we were always copacetic that way. But uh, yeah, I really don't think we need, uh, we already have Sam Ash, we have chain guitar stores already, uh, music stores in New York City. And I don't think New York City is really designed to have those kind of stores here and we really don't need them. But um, you know, they, they have every right to be, I guess you have to look at it that way too. I'll tell you what, Rick, from, from because I was always in touch with, uh, you know, I did a lot of business with the Fender people and the Martin people and the Taylor people. They did a lot of business with Ash and GC here in the city. So uh, would it have gone elsewhere to other Ashes and GCs if um, they hadn't been here? I think not. Um, it definitely increased their business. I didn't, it didn't affect me. We have, you know, and like you, it's a very personal place. You know, you got knowledgeable people sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, not some kid who barely knows the difference between a a B and a B flat. Um, we used to say that um, going into GC was like it, it was it was like a, a plumbing supply house saying they were experts on fish because they both had something to do with water. Uh, it, it, there was uh, oh, no. you got no you got no expertise there, yeah. so uh, it, it didn't really affect me. I remember interestingly, 
Uh, the Ash family, you know what, at least it's a family owned business. It's not a corporate thing like GC. And I know the Ash people. Uh, Sammy, the youngest of the three brothers, is a dear friend. And um, I remember, this is probably around 1975 or six when I was across the street. And I was talking to his dad, Jerry Ash. D Jerry and his wife, Sammy's parents, they are the ones who built the Ash store from one store in Brooklyn that was their parents on Utica Avenue out in Crown Heights up to eight stores, um, uh, which was um, 48th Street and um, White Plains and uh, Carl Place, Long Island, this kind of thing. But when, when Guitar Center, there were a few other chains that started up that, that fell apart. What was it um, in Florida? I'm trying to I forget their names already. Uh, there were two other chains. I'm just blanking. Thoroughbred was one, gone. And there was another one in Florida, gone. And when Guitar Center came up and all of a sudden, what would happen was um, uh, Sam Ash would open a new store in say Akron, Ohio. Well, GC would open across the street. GC would open a store in Tampa. Ash would open across the street. It got to about 45 stores and Jerry said, you know what, let them have it. I'm done. I'm, I'm, this, is, this is my family, the hell with them. And uh, J Jerry Ash was very astute. He was actually one of my retail heroes, a wonderful person. So, uh, but the Guitar Center, as many of us in the industry now know, it says file chapter 11. We couldn't be happier. They're not going away so soon, but. Uh, eh. So uh, did it affect, yeah, of course it did. It, it affected us because people were always coming in and, and saying, oh, I could get it for this cheaper and here and that, you know what? Go, I don't care. Yep, yep. Yeah, you, you want service, fine. You know, you get what you pay for. And uh, we did okay. We all did okay here. The, the village is the village. I mean, it, it's the only place I wanted to be from when I was like 13 or 14 years old. And, uh, you know, there were other guitar here, guys here, um, Rick, long gone before you came that you may not know of. Did you know of Pietro Carboni? On the Tugel yes, Street? yes. Did you know him at all? I remember going over there, yeah. The butcher of McDougal Street. Little, little shop on McDougal, yeah. Right where King Street butts into it. He, yep, yep. He, the guy was personally responsible for the total destruction of more 19th century Martin guitars than I think any other single guy around. Well, You pull out the insides and whatever. Yeah. Uh, and also there was, of course, um, uh, Manuel Velasquez, the wonderful man, made those wonderful uh, classical guitars. And Eugene Clark, who is one of the best ever, he was also uh, uh, with, with Mikey Gurian and, and uh, right. all the other guys at the corner of Carmine and Bedford. And um, there were others. Um, can't remember. But uh, th look, th this neighborhood, fortunately, th thank God for Andrew Berman of GVSHP. God bless him for uh, being as, uh, pardon me, but pain in the butt that he is. He is relentless in preservation of this neighborhood and the east side, the whole downtown. And there would be a lot more of it gone if it wasn't for Andrew, including, by the way, uh, where you and I are now, we are part of Greenwich Village Historic District. Up yeah. to 10 years ago, we were not. You know where it stopped, Rick? It came along Bleecker Street, went up Jones, cut through in the middle of the block between Bleecker and 4th Street from, jo from Jones to Cornelia, came back down, so I was not in it. Yeah. Um, and you were not in it. Um, uh, for we became historic in this building, and my landlady didn't even know her building that she's been in. Well, you're, you're a landmark building, I would think. Which is landmark. you're in the historic yeah. district now, but you're also a landmark building. Landmark, yeah. Which is separate. You got it. I mean, she can't even do pointing up on the bricks yeah. without having the color approved. Um, this this building is not landmark, yeah. yeah. But it is 100 years old this year, 1920. Yeah. And it's a, it's rock solid. You got another question? Many, yes. You got many. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, let's see. Um, okay. So Tom in Southern California wants to know, where do you see the vintage guitar market going? Yeah. Um, are the upcoming generations going to appreciate these works of art? I don't have a crystal ball. I'll tell you another great, great <laughs> story. Right on the corner, and Rick, I bet you know the place, right in the corner of, across 7th Avenue from me, 
Bleaker, there's there's that funny little wedge-shaped building with a fortune teller in it. You know the building? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I knew the family that lived in there. And um, one of the guys who was um, maybe a little older than me, he was a guitar nut. And he used to come in and hang out. He was a very funny guy. And um, I, we liked him a lot. His name was, uh, the last name was Eli, John Eli. So one day someone came in and, he, and John is sitting pulling our guitars up front and I'm a little further down the counter chair and somebody's giving me a hard time about I, I, unanswerable questions. You know, you, you, you predict it, predict that. I can't predict it. And I said, look, I can't predict the future. I don't have a crystal ball, you know. And Johnny Eli jumps up and goes, ah, he starts waving his hand around pointing to himself. Oh, crystal ball, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where it's gonna go in the future, I don't know. I can tell you that it, for the last three or four years, it has gone down and you have seen prices go down. Here's something very telling. On uh, Reverb, which has recently been purchased by Etsy or somebody like that, um, up until some point last year, every single posting on Reverb had on it how long the thing had been up there. Yeah, yeah, if this has been listed for a week, for five days, for five hours, for five months, for five years, it doesn't say that anymore. Guess why? So the, the prices of vintage stuff, they've gone down 20, 30%. Uh, guitars that I used to be able to sell in my store with no problem for $6,000. If I have one today like it, I price it at more than four, I'm dead in the water. Thanks. Rick, we've got a bunch of questions about Cindy and your work with her. Cindy. Okay. What do you want to know? For Rick. <laughs> Cindy whom, if I may ask. Cindy's a bit was been working here for uh, 10 years now. Oh. Yeah. What, do, you, what you, do they want to know about Cindy? Can you say something about your wonderful designing guitars with Cindy and her builds? Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah, Cindy came walking in here one time, I guess uh, over 10 years now. And uh, she's been uh, working here first as an apprentice and now she's got her own line of guitars and she just collaborated with uh, Stuart McDonald Guitar Shop Supply and they're offering one of her new guitars out and uh, it's a contest going on right now. And uh, Cindy's guitar is featured. You can go to her our website, uh, cindyguitars.com or her Instagram and you can enter to get this free beautiful guitar that she's offering up right now. And yeah, she's just a wonderful person. She's one of my, she is my best friend and now she's uh, gonna take over the store when I'm gone. Hopefully she'll continue on. She's a great <laughs> builder, really incredible, uh, uh, you know, artisan in her own right. She's an amazing artist and wood, wood uh, worker. And uh, she's gonna continue on when we're all gone. Well, what that, else do you want to know about Cindy? That definitely that definitely helps to answer um, our question about the the next generation. So I'm, yes. I'm glad. You I'm got, glad you gotta about be able that. to pass this on to somebody. You know, this is a uh, uh, awful lot of years and knowledge and uh, you know experiences that uh, hopefully will won't die with me and Matt. And when uh, this will continue on. She's with Stu Mac because. Um... They are the premier people for uh, guitar maker supplies uh, for uh, woods and, and mostly for hardware and all that. They started out with banjos. Yes, um, I, I remember I, back in the banjo day when they were just doing banjos. I, I have a dealer number. That, I mean, their dealer numbers are like five digits. My dealer number is like four or something. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I got a sticker on my window outside that for DiMarzio. I was their first customer there in 1974. <laughs> well, well uh, Stu Mack is run by a guy named Jay Hostetler, who yeah, is terrific. Uh, he's a wonderful person, and uh, I'm very glad to hear that uh, Cindy is working with them. Yeah. I mean, they're working with her. Oh, so great. Um, okay. I have a couple more questions for you, Rick, specifically. Um, do you prefer building guitars to customer spec or building whatever the wood or materials suggest? Hmm. Well, I, I guess a little bit of both. I mean, I do love doing what I like. You know, you always kind of want to veer towards what, building whatever you feel and having somebody want that. But I love people and I love their input and I love uh, still building to what they have in mind. You know, you want to make your customer happy 
And if he's going to live with this instrument, and if he's going to use it, you want to, you have to meet a certain amount of his spec. There's a lot of you know tailoring that we do to neck size and uh, radiuses on the fingerboard, fret wire, string gauge, whatever you know, in order to accommodate a, a guitar player who's been maybe playing for 40 years and and knows what he wants. So you can't just build whatever you want. You know, you're the builder, but you also have to accommodate the player. And uh, the player's the most important part of the whole uh, uh, proposition. Thanks. Um, oh my gosh, I think this is the most active q and I've ever, ever <laughs> done. Um, <laughs> OK, OK, here we go. Um, also, a question for you, Rick, from Jason. When was the first time you met Lou Reed? Oh, the first time was uh, when I had the shop on Downing Street, actually. Uh, he had a guitar player named Chuck. I think it was Chuck Connor, actually. And uh, I started doing, he was actually living on Downing Street at the time. And he said he was playing uh, guitar with Lou Reed. And, and he had a bunch of Roland synthesizer guitars at that time that I started working on with Lou. And soon after, Lou found out about my guitars. And I started uh, making him a couple. Then I made him about three more in the night in about 1992, and uh, just before he he died, uh, he had three or four of my new Bowery Pines series. He had uh, brought on a new guitarist, Aaron Bajakum, and Aaron was playing one of my guitars, and Lou saw that, and he had to have the same thing. Of course, Lou was that way. With yeah, Lou, Lou was an interesting guitar player. He actually you know, loved handmade instruments and worked with a lot of other builders over the years. He was really generous with his knowledge of what he wanted and really supported a lot of us builders. That's so great. Um, I have a question for both of you. What is the most unusual guitar request you've gotten? Guitar request? <laughs> That's some unusual guitars, that's for sure. Uh, we had one guitar that looked like a lacquered chicken. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it, it, it was bought by Kathy Bates. Y yes, and when she finally had a turnaround a couple of years later and said, oh, I'm not gonna play guitar anymore. I'm shipping you all my guitars, I, I, I'm selling them all. She shipped me that one, then she said, oh, ship that one back to me. I decided I wanna keep that one. Uh, <laughs> But guitar request, we, well, we're not builders. So, you know, um, any request we would have would be for older stuff that's maybe uncommon or rare, but uh, not really unusual. O other than Glenn Branca, did you know him, uh, Rick? Glenn Branca? Uh, no. He, he was into, uh, what would you call it? Performance art? I don't know what it was. He would take lap steel guitars and beat on the strings with hammers. Mm. This was, um, he made some of that music. Yeah, some of that stuff that sounds like a fire in a pet shop. Mm -hmm. Can't listen to it. <laughs> uh, I, you, you're the guy for unusual requests, I would think. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I've made guitars in the shape of airplanes and I've made uh, guitars that uh, I'm, I'm actually just finishing up one now, the gunslinger guitar, and it's, uh, it's got all the uh, guitar slingers, we call it. And, uh -huh. so, and it has two guns coming off of it. So uh -huh. yeah, I've done a lot, of, a lot of really strange request guitars. I like to bring a little bit of my sculpture background into guitar making. And I have a lot of fun with that. And it kind of takes me away from what I am known for, which is the Telecaster and Stratocaster shapes. So I get to do some really wild, crazy things with guitars that I'm making an archery bow guitar right now for a customer, so, which is a lot of fun. It, uh, it's, you know, it, the guitars, solid body guitars, the nice thing about them is they lend themselves to all kinds of different shapes. Uh, you know, like the loose side guitars you were working with. I mean, you got a loose side body, that's not a wood body. It's not gonna vibrate the same, but the pickups yeah, and electronics cool, can make up for that. So it's, uh, you got a lot of freedom and you can do very sculptural things with solid, solid body electrics. And uh, Actually, yeah, I'm reminded, I'm sitting here, I'm staring at this thing. It's been hanging on my wall for 40 years. I got to take it off the wall and bring it in front of the camera because 
<laughs> and then I just remembered another, I remembered a, a request we got. We did get a request once. <laughs> um, okay. Can you, okay. See, can you see this in front of the camera? Can you see what this is? Oh, there you go. Oh my gosh. That's wow. the kind of thing we're talking yes. about. Uh, Marilyn. That's a Marilyn pose from the 1952 poster, Playboy <laughs> poster. Okay. Um, and um, I, I got it with it. I got the business card of the guy who made it in Key West, somewhere in the in the 1970s. I missed it, Mate, Matt. Oh. I'm sorry, I missed. Oh, okay, here. Wait, let me see if I can. I see what you're talking so about. Show. Hi, Sandy. Oh, little sexy little chick. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and what was famous about it? Somebody famous was supposed to have had one. It was maybe Frank Zappa. Um, but I, I remembered one. We did get a request in the shop. Soupy Sales, those of the older generation will remember that crazy TV guy. He had two sons. He had two boys. They were twins. This was in the 70s. And they played together in some kind of group. They brought, they, they brought in two Gibson Flying V guitars. And you guitar nuts know what a Flying V looks like. They asked us to combine them and make them into a single double neck Flying W. <laughs> which we did we we just cut down you know part, part of uh the, the right leg of one the left leg of the other and glued them together so they could play together incredible incredible um okay well i'm gonna i'm gonna move on somehow um so judith um hi judith Judith says, I was always sorry that I arrived in New York too late to visit Izzy Young's Folklore Center. Can you talk about that iconic place? Yes, because I worked there. Um, <laughs> Izzy was a very dear friend. Izzy's, the first Folklore Center was at 110 McDougal Street um, from 58 to 63. And in 1963, he moved to 321 Sixth Avenue. It's right above the subway entrance there by the well, the, the IFC Theater, the Waverly Theater, second floor, okay. Uh, and he was there from 63 to 73 when he closed it and he moved to Sweden uh, so that because the tax people were after him. <laughs> but, um, uh, and I, Eddie I Deal, know. Eddie Deal worked there. <laughs> Eddie Deal worked for me too. He did repair yeah. my place. Um, next door, also on the second floor, a guy named Mark Silver from Silver. Uh, from Berkeley opened the store called Fred and Instruments, and that was a guitar shop. Yeah, the repairs were done there. Eugene Clark worked there, by the way. Right, right. Um, and uh, Mark was my hero. He was my mentor. To this day, I'm in touch with him. I right. kind of modeled my whole story after him. At any rate, at one point around 1967 or eight, um, this is before I had a store. Um, 67. Um, for whatever reason, I had no place to have my business. I had to leave whatever space my repair workshop was in. And so I set up in the back of the Folklore Center. And so I was with Izzy every day. Um, I have to this day, I have Izzy's, I have his mother's chopped liver chopper and chopping bowl. Um, I have other stuff of Izzy's. And Izzy performed the wedding when Susie and I got married. Izzy had bought one of these, it was the Reverend Sum Young Moon or something, five bucks, you get a certificate and you can perform marriages. And we were married in the Folklore Center, uh, second floor there, 321 Sixth Avenue in uh, August of 1969. And uh, Susie had, had her bouquet. She had a batch of marijuana leaves. I mean, this was, this was hippie shit all the way. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, we catered it from, um, some of the places down on the Lower East Side from uh, not Katz's, but like um, Moshe's, uh, 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 Ben's Dairy and Moshe's uh, Bakery and all this stuff. Yona and, Schimmel. Um, I'm sorry? Yona Schimmel. Yona, yeah, exactly. And um, I still have somewhere the menu. I have pictures of the wedding. For guests, uh, those of you, certain generation remember David Bromberg, who was, I talked to him yesterday. We're good friends. Other people, Lucian Barnes, who was one of the guitar makers there on, on, on your corner, he was there. Um, Jeremy Steig, the flute player, and his father, Bill Steig, New Yorker cartoonist. I have no idea how he ended up there. Um, 
but Izzy was a wonderful, wonderful person uh, and a character. Um, he did a column in Sing Out magazine in the 50s and into the early 60s called Frets and Frails. Basically, it was, um, it was like a page six of the folk world. This guy is playing with this guy, this, this, this woman split up with that one, and blah, blah, blah. Um, you can find that stuff somewhere. And uh, he was a wonderful character. I have an Izzy Young story. I have a great Izzy Young story. So after Izzy signed the marriage certificate and all this, and Susie and I think, you know, maybe we should, you know, go to some official city building and get some official New York State thing. So we go down there to the municipal building with Izzy. We go into the marriage bureau. And um, the guy, Izzy shows the guy his credentials and the, you know, the whatever. And uh, he says, what church is this? The, the, the guy at the desk says, is it the Universal Life Church? And the guy says, Universal Life Church, that's not a legitimate church. And he goes, so, schmuck, you think the Catholic Church is legitimate? <laughs> it was like, classic is a young story. He was a wonderful person. He died last year, I guess, or the year before in his 90s. Um, when he, in the ensuing, in, well, in the past 10 or 20 years, when he came back to the States for three or four days at a time, he stayed at my house. And, um, and we miss him. He's one of those people. Oh, that's so wonderful. Thanks for those memories. Um, okay, just going, just going. Um, let's see. Like Anthony said, like a George Carlin line. That's that's right. That's right. Um, Jason wants to know, Rick, what was it like having Quine and Chris Whitley in the shop? I don't know who those people are, so maybe yeah, maybe Robert you can Quine, tell me. Uh, yeah, Bob, uh, Robert Quine was uh, played with Lou Reed and uh, Tom Waits and Mary Ann Faithful. So many people he played with, Mark Rebo. I met him through Mark Rebo, I think, it originally back when I first opened the store. And he was a regular here. He used to come in every day and uh, hang out at the shop. And Chris was a street singer at the time when I first met him on Downing Street. He came into my shop in the 1970s and he was just playing on the street. He was a little kid. And I sold him a couple of little guitars and then wound up making him a few guitars as he got older. And uh, he would do as a good friend, a great friend, great guy with Chris. And, and Bob was was uh, unbelievable guitar player, very original style, had his own style. He would be the test. Every time I built a guitar, I'd hand it to Bob and he had to test it to see if it was OK. And we got it, Bob's approval. It was great. But uh, he was, uh, he's on the Blue Mask album of Lou Reed. That's Bob's playing. He was uh, Richard Hell and the Voidoids. He was uh, yeah. one of the original yeah. Voidoids. And uh, uh, just an incredible, this the Blank Generation, the movie, if you've never seen or heard of the Blank Generation movie, it's an uh, unbelievable little cult film. Uh, it, it's wonderful. It shows uh, CBGB's in 1978. The city was really gritty back then. It was in the winter. And there was lots of old 70s cars parked in the snow. And uh, it was all themed around that uh, CBGBs at the time. And, yeah, uh, we've we've you know, got a couple of questions about like punk, punk yeah, guitar and CBGBs. And, and, and Bob was one of the originators. I mean, he certainly didn't look like a punk. He was at a suit jacket and, uh, you know, uh, at the time he had a beard and he was going bald and wound up completely bald. But uh, Bob was... Uh, was one of those guys that uh, just was uh, fit right in. He always had shades on, and he uh, he had just a, a really he was like a history of uh, you know guitarists and, and music from the 50s and 60s. He had millions of influences. He was a regular walking historian when it came to music and, and guitar playing. I think the Mark Rebo story. Yeah, Rebo, one of the best. He's in our movie too, Rebo. He's uh, got a great film. He's a wonderful spot. guy and a wonderful player. Great guy. So I, I one, one day, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, whatever, um, it was this time of year, it was Hanukkah, and I got this wild inspiration. Like I'm just sitting in my store and all of a sudden, bang, I had this urge to, uh, we had this electric menorah that we would put in the window. And I had this urge, I said, I can put vacuum tubes in there. I'm going to build an all-tube menorah. And in the course of the afternoon, 
I, I went uptown to all those stores that sell all that stuff. I found a, a, an appropriate one, an old, um, electric menorah. I ran down to Radio Shack. I bought tube sockets. I looked in my tube collection because I used to be fixed radios and TVs and stuff. I found all the right tubes, found a transformer, and I built the world's first and only all tube menorah. And we would light it up. So, and I still have this, by the way. So I, we have it sitting on the counter one day. And it's like, this maybe the second or third day. There's two or three tubes in it for two or three candles. Mark Rebo walks in. He, it was just about at sundown, too, when you're supposed to light the candles. So um, Mark Rebo walks in. We stick in a couple. We turn the thing on and put in the two or three tubes. They light it up. Mark immediately breaks out into the entire Hanukkah prayer in Hebrew. <laughs> just like that. I, who knew? <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Other side of Mark Rebo. <laughs> who knew he the whole thing he just ran all the way through it all the verses amazing um oh my gosh i have one question here there's a steve edelman it's a fairly common name but could this possibly be the steve edelman i went to high school with or elementary school or something yes the answer is yes yes really in two in tucson right have either of you two been to tucson this was this was uh -oh. steve's question Right, he has a guitar store in Tucson. Uh huh. True. Is that a yes? Yes, he did. And and we went to school together as kids. Is that true from Brooklyn? Yeah. Holy cow! Whole <laughs> world. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Um, we've got a great anonymous question, which um, I'm gonna ask. Oh gosh, I can't even find it. I'm going to ask to both of you, um, after so many years in retail, you've probably built a lot of relationships with a lot of employees. What do you think your employees would say about you? Now? <laughs> they had a hell of a good time here. They met a lot of good people here and they got full health insurance <laughs> and none of them quit. <laughs> What, what about you, Rick? Uh, I would say probably the same, except uh, I never had health insurance for any of them. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them I'm still friendly with uh, Candace Hansen, who at the time was Candace Smith, woman who worked at my store, um, I guess, right at the very end across the street and for somewhere like around 1981 to maybe 1985. And in here, I saw her yesterday. She's my son's godmother. Amazing. Yeah. Loyal, loyal is right, Anthony, yes. Um, okay, we've got so many questions. We have questions about Washington Square Park. We have questions about jazz guitarists. We have questions about Cafe Vivaldi. Mm. So pe people, I, people I don't know, but what, what, about, what about those things? I mean, so much music in Washington Square Park. I was part of it in when I was like high school years, like in the mid 60s, early 60s, and everybody would go and play a lot of bluegrass and stuff there and folky people. And um, many people afterwards would, uh, at the end of the day, would go over to Allen Block Sandal Shop, which what's there now? It's on 4th Street. It's right where Jones Street butts in. There's a, a coffee shop there. It's a big double store. It was a lot of fun and, you know, and a lot of bad music um, <laughs> uh, and, and some good music. Rick, do you have do you ever have much interaction over there on, on any of that stuff? Rory, Rory Block, yeah, it was her uh, it was her father, right? Yeah, Rory. yeah, Alan, yeah, yeah, Alan Block. Uh, not really with them, but uh, the Washington Square Park. I mean, I just remember so many musicians when the word would spread that you know you could come to my store and get a cheap repair, and mm -hmm. that's kind of what I meant before about you know working for the regular guy and the street singers and. I always found them to be the most interesting people. And uh, you get a lot of characters, but you start to really see uh, very interesting people with big stories. And a lot of times when you don't have nothing, you have music and Washington Square Place was the place to express that. Yeah. And uh, I guess the family looks there. better in the middle now. I don't know. I think it was just as nice when it was a little crooked. I kind of liked it when it was a little cockeyed. <laughs> but uh, aside from that, it's still oh, yeah. Park. Yeah. 
Yeah. If I can butt in for a second. Edelman, Roger Sprung, yes. Mark Horowitz, yes. Bill Keith, no. Bill lived in Woodstock. And that was a whole other thing. He was not a Washington Square Park person. He was in Boston in the early years. And uh, Roger Sprung always, and in fact, Jeannie Myers, a woman, local woman, for the last several years has had an annual Washington Square Park reunion in September. And um, Mark Horowitz always came with that damn banjo. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question from Eric. What advice would you have um, for the next generation of builders and repair folks? Rick and I, I know we, got the, we both got the same advice. I know it. <laughs> Go and do it. Yeah, just keep working. Yeah. Work at it hard. Just uh, make it your passion. If you want to do it bad enough, you will move heaven and earth to get it done. If you right. don't move heaven and earth to get it done, it means you didn't want it bad enough. It's as simple That's as right. that. People would always tell me, oh, teach me. Can I be an apprentice? No. I don't have time to waste on that. <laughs> I think if you're going to be a builder, you should really build what music you like. If you don't like violin music don't start making violins if you like classical music then you should build classical guitars but if you like uh jimi hendrix build solid body guitars that's, that's what we all tend to do my first instrument was a banjo neck i was all steamed up about bluegrass and earl scruggs when i was like 13 14 years old you gotta enjoy what you do you know you really have to enjoy it that's when you'll do your best work mm -hmm. all i could find was a tenor banjo and um, I was living in Brooklyn with my parents, of course. And uh, I would come into the city, as they said, and, and find all these people like uh, Carboni and, and Mark Silver and uh, Noah Wolf and whoever else there was around. And say, oh, do you have any five string necks? No. Can you make me one? No. Why don't you make one? Oh. And I did. I made one in pattern making class in Brooklyn Tech in high school. Wow. I was good enough with my tools so that the pattern, those, those of you who know what casting and foundry is, you know what pattern making is. It's working with hand tools to make exact things out of wood, precise things. And uh, I, I was into the bluegrass. I would die to have a banjo. My parents wouldn't buy me one. I made it, I found the tenor banjo, made a neck. That's what, uh, that's what got me off. I have a question for Rick from Greg. Um, how has the change in music and the change in people in the area from the 1970s until today changed your business? And do you have any thoughts about that? I don't really think it's changed that much. I mean, uh, there may be a little less of the music scene because the clubs don't really, uh, you know, let people play for... Uh, like they charge them to play now in, in some of the clubs before the clubs would pay you back in the early days. There was a lot more clubs. There used to be besides CBGBs, there were you know, clubs all over the place that you could play. There were 15 clubs right on Bleecker Street that you used to be able to go in and play. So for you know, local musicians and local bands, the scene was you know, a lot more prominent back in the day, just like there was a lot more mom and pop shops back in the day and there are a lot less now and oh, the old nice. historic buildings that used to be all over the neighborhood are slowly disappearing um but i i'm hope i'm hopeful that things will come back at least in the music scene that there will be more places for people to play eventually uh, besides you know out in the cold in washington square park that you'll be able to actually go to a club again now it seems like most of the clubs that i see are way over on the west side by the river uh, with a blacked out room that nobody even knows it's a club. And that's unfortunate, but uh, the scene certainly has changed. Mm. I have a question for you again, um, Rick, from Dina, who, and a couple of questions about pine guitars and how durable they are. And does the wood harden with age? Yeah. Um, Questions. Yeah, the pine that questions. I use is, uh, is, is different than your lumberyard pine. You don't really want to use lumberyard pine. Those are trees that are forced to grow quickly. And, and if you go to the lumberyard and find a two by four, it's actually one whole tree. You'll see the full circle. The wood we use is actually from old growth timbers. The trees were huge. They were 300 feet tall, 300 years old. They were uh, just a completely different kind of tree. And when they were harvested, they were put into these buildings where they sat 
for 200 more years seasoning. So the wood is extremely dense. Uh, it's not at all like uh, lumberyard pine. So the pine wood that I use is, is really not the same kind of wood. It's white pine I use and a lot of Southern yellow pine for necks that I like because it's a little stiffer, it stays straighter. It's so straight and so stiff that you don't even need uh, a truss rod in the necks. It's amazing wood. And uh, because of that, it makes the whole instrument so much more resonant. You know what? I've got a um, a one-off Martin guitar built in the Martin used to have an R&D department. They don't anymore, but they had some interesting builders there. I have a Martin Dreadnought. The entire body is spruce. The top, the back, and the sides. Wonderful guitar. Oh yeah, great sound of it. Yeah, yeah. Leo Fender's first Telecasters were actually made of pine because Leo was also making amps before he made guitars. And he had a pile of amplifier wood sitting on the floor. And I think they made the first prototype and about the, the first five guitars from that pile of pine. You can tell because it's sandwiched pieces on the first five bodies. And uh, those, those are priceless instruments now, of course. But, uh, you know, they went to hardwood later more because it was the availability. The, the factor that uh, it was the story with the lumberyard pine again. Nobody wants to go and do what I do where you have to pull nails out of the wood and and it's going to have checks and knots and you know I always thought that may be a problem until I started making them and people love the character in the wood when you have uh, deep, you know natural things happening in, in the look and the appearance of the instrument. And um, so we're <laughs> We're we're near we're nearing the end and we have 40 questions still. So just just to let you know how much people want to hear your stories. This is so yeah, this is... we're two old guys. This will be doing it. Um I'm gonna I'm gonna end, I think, with a question from Brian, um, which is about the guitars themselves. Have you noticed that your guitars are traded, sold, or gifted? Or are they mostly treasured and kept by the original purchasing musicians? Is that for you, me, or Matt? That's for I think both of you. You start, oh, Rick. Okay. Uh, look, I, I had a store and we sold thousands of guitars a year, so it, it was a, a different kind of thing. People would buy them to play, or they would buy them for gifts, and it was, you know, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but when somebody was sitting down and trying a whole bunch of guitars and working with my staff to find the one that fit them, then you know, you're probably gonna keep it and treasure it. And I, I get people coming in here still, uh, um, or, or calling me, or I get emails all the time, oh, I bought this guitar from you in 1978 or 1982 or when 19, whatever it was, 2005. And, or what I get also is what we did for years a little decal on the back of the pegged said Matt Newman off guitars New York. It's a little gold decal, a real water-based thing. You had to soak it and put it on. And I, I am constantly getting emails from across the country, from Europe, from wherever. Oh, I have this Fender Telecaster I bought used and it has your name on it. And what can you tell me about this? I don't know. <laughs> I think there's thousands of them. <laughs> but but uh, you know, they get around. The instruments get around. They got stories. What about you, Rick? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel that when somebody buys the guitar, for me, it's a wonderful thing when they come back 30 years and say it's still their favorite guitar and they, they you know, there's nothing, nothing more rewarding than that. I find that to be true. But a lot of times, if it doesn't fit, they may have to move it on. And a lot of times they run out of money and the guitar has to move on. But it always seems to find the right owner in the end. And that's a wonderful thing about it. I love that. Thank you so much. And thank you both so much also for contributing Village Preservation Oral Histories, which for everyone who's still here with us, um, I'm going to send out an email with lots and lots and lots of links in it. Um, the things that we've mentioned tonight and also to um, Rick and Matt's oral histories um, through Village Preservation. We're so grateful for that. Um, and that 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 those oral histories brought brought us together this evening. Um, it's just such a such a wonderful thing. And That's such a um, smile on your face all night. You're you're one happy woman. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, uh, well, you know, this is this is why I do all the work that I do. It's so fun. So those old buildings. <laughs> That's right. And the and the businesses that live in them and and, sure. and make and make yeah. the village what it is. So that's um, save that's, the glory days. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's the dream. So thank you, thank you both so so much for your time that's and good. for for all of your work and all that you that you well, do. Thank you, Ariel. This for has been a lot of fun. Yeah, this has been so fun. And thank you to everyone who's been here with us. Um, for those of you who have been asking, we have been recording this. Uh, so if you want to watch it again or share it around, uh, that will that will be one of the links that I will send out to all of you hopefully tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. And um, happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> Wonderful holidays. Take good care, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Night.